eight minutes after 10 o'clock. Well, I plan to talk with you on the year as we are now, Bob. How are you doing? Very well, Ken. That's good. We have Bob Orban on the line, and uh, this is a real treat for me because um, I admire anybody that can keep coming up with the, the material like you do over the years. Well, I've been in the business, the comedy writing business, for 34 years, and uh, I set a quota of 25 jokes a day, seven days a week, and uh, and I've done that for most of 34 years, uh, turning out books. Uh, this is jo uh, the uh, 2,500 jokes to start them laughing is my 44th book, so you've got to keep on a treadmill to keep up that sort of production. That's incredible. I've talked to many entertainers, of course, who I'm sure have used some of your material, if not maybe their whole act is composed of it, I'm not sure. But uh, they always, of course, are, are happy-go-lucky. They keep saying that comedy is a very serious business, so whenever I talk to somebody such as yourself who writes jokes primarily, I, I never really know what to expect. I have a, a strange feeling that I may start talking with you and you may break down into tears. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, uh, most of the comedians, the professional performers, are sort of manic and depressive uh, in alternate stages. Most of the comedy writers are really quiet types. I'm more often taken for a minister or a mortician than a comedy writer. <laughs> I, they once wanted, in fact, to get me for what's my line, figuring uh, that, that nobody would ever guess. But unfortunately, they had uh, a comedian on the show, and they knew right away that he'd spot me. Uh -huh. So that was the end of that. Have you ever done stand-up comedy yourself? No, uh, actually, behind, uh, within every comedy writer, there's a scared comic trying to get out, but most of us are a little too terrified of standing up there naked in front of audiences doing jokes, so we content ourselves with sitting in the back row and writing the jokes. Now you get naked if the jokes don't go over, right? You just sort of... <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> Try anything. You know, there's a very indelicate term in uh, show business called flop sweat, in which you get the hot and cold flashes, and, uh, and your <laughs> hands cold, turn cold and clammy, and I've had it sometimes when I, I do banquet speeches and luncheon speeches, uh, teaching people how to use humor in speeches, and when a joke doesn't go, that's an awful feeling of wanting to just shrivel through the floorboards. You know, there's a service, I think, and I don't know if this is a competitive service to you or not, but there's one out in California where I know they work with people. Uh, they, they deal with politicians, and I know you write for politicians, but they, they try to convince them that this material is going to work, and they work with them how to deliver it. Actually, that's half the ball game, isn't it? That is. Uh, that is why the, what I do uh, also. I hold one-day humor workshops for corporations in which I teach their uh, speakers how to use humor in public speaking and then their writers and their PR men how to construct it. And, uh, I, yes, delivery is 50%, but if I've got somebody, a performer or a speaker, who can just get the words out, uh, if the joke is constructed properly, you'll get the laugh. It's a marriage. You need both. Uh -huh. And I suppose some people can use a joke, and some people can take that same joke and just bomb with it. Uh, yeah, and you've also got to uh, 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 effectively assess who your audience is, to know what they want to hear and what they will accept from you. For instance, uh, simultaneously during the 60s, I was a writer on the Red Skelton show, and I was also writing for Dick Gregory. Uh, the uh, black comedian activist. Now, you couldn't find two more diverse uh, personalities. The material I wrote for one couldn't be used for the other, and vice versa. So when you, when you get a joke book, like 2,500 jokes to uh, start them laughing, what you've got to do is essentially turn pages and mark, up, uh, mark off the jokes that are right for your personality and then the jokes that will be right for your audience. And that's the key to success. You're quoted all the time by uh, Paul Harvey, who's heard on this station. We have uh, many times run across Bob Orban lines, and probably half the time we hear them, we don't even know that you wrote them. <laughs> that <But> happens, yes. <laughs> do you ever sit back and say, well, gee, that guy stole that line from me. Does that ever get under you? Well, not, not really, in the sense that um, uh, feeling uh, uh, really has to be defined a little further. Uh, this book, 2,500 Jokes to Start Them Laughing, is meant for people to use, to use in their own speeches, to use on the radio. The only thing that would constitute stealing is a copyright violation. It just means you can't reprint the material, but you can tell it as much as you like, and it should be told as your own material. That's one of the hard, hard things to define, though, isn't it? Really, we're where one guy's idea leaves off and another guy's picks up, probably, because uh, I don't, you really can't copyright a, a joke per se, can you? No, you can't. Uh, you can try, but I have never heard of anybody who has successfully defended the, the rights to use one joke. 
you can copyright and defend successfully, as we have on a number of occasions, uh, the theft of a number of jokes. But one joke is up for grabs. Then it almost becomes a routine that you steal. That's right. That's I right. see. This is fascinating. Bob Orban is our guest this morning. Uh, he's written a new book, as we mentioned, 2,500 Jokes to Start Him Laughing. We'll talk about it, and we'll come back after a commercial or two. Hi, this is Crazy Curd. Come on down and visit American Trio's new budget store at 311 North Main in Bloomington. We've been open a month, and the bargains get better all the time. We're lucky to have special contacts with the leading manufacturers of budget furniture, so we can offer you lower-priced furniture without sacrificing quality. With the cost of housing rising, often there's just not enough left over to furnish your home. We hope to solve that problem with great furniture buys. For example, this week you can take advantage of great buys like desks in Oak or Walnut for just $55. Bookcases are just $33. A wide selection of three-way lamps for just $16, $18, or $22. Or how about a sofa, love seat, and chair, plus a set of three tables, cocktail and two-in, with the entire grouping costing you just $299. That's at American Trio's Budget Store, 311 North Main in Bloomington. And now, here's Crazy Kurt with a thought for the day. Some people will believe anything if it's whispered to them. The Gala Restaurant in El Paso offers dinner specials that are fantastic. You can't beat the deliciously prepared food or the budget-pleasing prices. Try the new Thursday dinner special at the Gala, Beef Kebab. It's juicy sirloin combined with green peppers, onions, tomatoes, and mushrooms on a skewer, served with a crisp green tossed salad and your choice of potato or rice pilaf, all for only $5.75. Tonight, treat yourself to good food and good service at reasonable prices at the Gala Restaurant in El Paso. Channel 43 can still become a reality, bringing top quality sports, travel and adventure series, children and youth programs, and much, much more into the homes of Central Illinois. But Grace Communications will need your continuing interest and support to get the job done. Look for further details in your newspaper, details about Channel 43 and Family TV for Central Illinois. It's in your best interest. Have you ever felt, Bob, at times almost like the guy who ran the copyright office years and years ago who said every possible invention has been invented? Do you ever feel that way about jokes? <laughs> every once in a while there's a slow day and there's no news. Uh, 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 an attack rabbit hasn't gone after the president. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's just nothing in the news. And you sit there and you start to say to yourself, whatever made you think you could be a comedy writer? And, uh, and in a quiet sort of a way, the flop sweat starts to run. But uh, it's called making a living, and you just hang in there, and eventually you come up with subjects. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, uh, it's not only in the teller, but it's in the hearer as well. And you have to come up... I, well, you can't define humor, really, can you? Yeah. It's very hard to. I just came back from a conference out on the West Coast uh, called the Second International Conference on Humor. And they had 270 academics who were out there essentially trying to figure out and coming up with theories as to why people laugh. And I've never known a professional comedian or comedy writer who ever spent two minutes thinking about it. Uh, we all have a gut-level feeling that if you do it this way, uh, it works. And that's as much as you ever want to know. Some of those conferences can be some of the dullest things, right? Cause... This wasn't. They're, they're, this was a lot of fun. I think the academics are uh, uh, taking a step into the real world. And on the last day, there was a panel of professional comedy writers. Uh, it was me, Roger Price, and uh, Hal Cantor, and a couple of others. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But once you start to analyze any given joke, well... It disappears. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the sadness of some of these conferences is that they try to analyze humor without ever telling a joke, which, <laughs> which, which just sets you up for ridicule on the part of the press. Mm -hmm. Listen, 829-2345 is our number. If you have a question for Bob Orman this morning, give us a call, or 1-800-322-9377 is our incoming watch line. I know you wrote for uh, President Ford. Um, you write for a lot of political people, don't you? Well, I, I have written for a few administrations and many congressmen and senators. Uh, uh, the reason that uh, the President Ford affiliation was so well known is that I was a speechwriter there, not, not just a comedy writer, and uh, for the last year, year at the White House. I was director of the White House speech writing department. So I spent a lot of time with President Ford, and uh, uh, he, he was quite, is quite, a confident joke teller, and uh, has never gotten full credit for how well he used humor in many different situations. 
just wasn't recognized for it. Well, the first year, we used humor a great deal, and we overcame some of the pitfalls that uh, President Carter is falling into now. But then during the campaign, when they made me head of the speechwriting department, uh, there was no longer the chance, uh, time to sit down. Writing humor takes an awful lot of time. And uh, once you start working 14, 16-hour days keeping the speeches moving, uh, there was no longer the time to be funny. Let me uh, take a phone call here. You're on the air with Bob Orban. Yes, I'd like to ask Bob what's um, his favorite joke. Ah, <laughs> it's, really, it's really whatever the joke of the moment is, uh, in the sense that you, you have something come up like the attack rabbit with President Carter, and uh, that day I wrote a joke that uh, Jimmy could be the first president ever to make the 7 o'clock news, the 11 o'clock news, and Wild Kingdom on the same <laughs> night. <laughs> That's so, good. It's, it's that joke. Next week it'll be something else. Thank you for calling. Thank you. Appreciate it. Again, 829-2345 is our number. Um, when it comes to, like, this rabbit thing, eventually it, you can just mention it and people start laughing, but it eventually it gets to a point where it, it finally maybe becomes tiresome, right? Absolutely. There's a critical point, and it's very important a speaker knows it, uh, when a subject is, is out. I remember every once in a while, uh, I did six years as a writer on the Red Skelton show, and uh, at that time, Agnew, Spiro Agnew, was the hot subject. You couldn't lose with a Spiro Agnew joke. So every week in the monologue, we had Spiro Agnew jokes. And at one point, Red said enough. And uh, Red had an unerring instinct for when, when to cut off a subject. Because now, if you do a Billy Carter joke, it's really over the hill. Uh, right now, because of the president's uh, involvement in that race, uh, where he was seen to uh, collapse, uh, suddenly the rabbit is, is one one subject back and probably is over with. I see. You're on the air. Do you have a question? Yes. He just said he worked with Red Skelton. That's some of his writing. What is Red Skelton really like to work with or work for? Well, I know that that subject might have been prompted by this new book coming out uh, about Red, but I worked for Red for six years, and I hold, heard all the stories about eccentricities, and... Uh, and certainly, uh, Red himself used to say that uh, if he wasn't making so much money, they'd lock him up. But uh, he was perhaps, it was the most stable show I've ever worked on. We kept bankers' hours. We were always in the top five. And uh, so as far as I'm concerned, Red Skelton is tops. He's a masterful performer. He, he comes of a generation of performers that can do everything. He sings. He can dance. He can do magic. He juggles. He's a great... Uh, monologist, he does sketches, he does pantomime, and when that breed of older comedians uh, goes, uh, we will, uh, will have lost a very uh, great national treasure. He should be on television. That's the way I feel about him, too. I think that the kids of today are really missing something by not seeing him, and they don't have to have all these dirty stories and, and things to watch. I, gr I agree. On television. Right to the networks. Oh, we do. <laughs> oh, very good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for calling. The interesting thing about uh, Red Skelton, I guess, is I maybe mean, you mentioned it. He's, he also paints, and he's doing that kind of thing now, too. I've found that the talented people of the world just seem to spill over with talent. And uh, beyond what they do to make a living, they have talents in all many different directions. Red not only paints, he paints, uh, he raises prize-winning roses, and he composes. Uh, the man is a genius, uh, and uh, you just have to stand in awe of all that he gets uh, done in a 24-hour day. Getting back to your book here, Bob, the 2,500 jokes to start him laughing, um, I know you talked about uh, how humor has changed, and I would say Red Skelton has kept right up with things, or maybe maybe humor doesn't change in his case because his is universal, I think. That's his, right. his kind of humor will just be laughable 100 years from now. Mm -hmm. But uh, you say now that and you can see this in a lot of the, uh, well, say the MTM productions, how fast they hit you. I saw a new thing last night that involves, uh, in fact, there's a gal that graduated from Illinois Wesleyan in, ah. in our own town who's on that show. And uh, it's such a fast-paced show. Uh, they keep throwing one line after another, and there's just a lot of movement, a lot of activity. And that kind of goes along with what you, what, with what you do with these fast one-liners. Uh, that's right. The, the essence of 2,500 jokes to start them laughing are one-liners, but... Uh, sometimes you really got to slow up. Uh, you, you've even got to slow up the one-liner. The essence of a joke that works is that it should have a certain comedic truth to it. 
And for instance, in this book is one of my favorite closings to a speech. I don't do that many speeches, and since and and like many other speakers, uh, you start off a little nervous, and you point that out to the audience. And I've got a long joke which I won't go into uh, uh, for for nervousness. But then at the end, I point out that now that the speech is over, I'd like to make a little confession that all week long I've been practicing this speech, and since nobody else was at home, I was practicing it in front of my dog. Now, if there's any aspect of the speech that you enjoyed and you want to show your pleasure, please don't applaud. Just bark. <laughs> now, that, that is a warm sort of joke, and uh, in front of an audience, I guarantee you, that will really get a big round of applause, and it's an honest joke. Mm-hmm. There is definitely a uh, quality there that people look for, I would think. Very quiet, uh, no, no, no doubt about it. And the essence of the book also is that it covers 266 different subjects, everything from advertising to X-rated movies. So and it's in alphabetical order, so you can really find it. That's right. So if you're going to do a joke to a real estate group or, or a, um, a church group, there's something that pertains to that audience. And again, if you come out with honest humor, it will work. Just okay. We mentioned honesty. There's there's something about the the well in Johnny Carson, for instance. There's something about the 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 kind of bad little boy idea. If you if you can say a joke with kind of a twinkle in your eye, you can get laughs sometimes too, right? That's right. Even even when you're going into the ground, uh, one of the things that that uh, people like about Johnny so much is that uh, they know it's live, so they know that uh, canned laughter can't help him out, and he knows that canned laughter can't help him out. So when he goes into the ground. He is always ready with what in the trade is called savers. If you write for Johnny Carson, you have to turn in two savers every night. And on the cue cards in front of Johnny are these savers. Not all of them, but the ones that he likes best. And so when a joke does uh, go into the ground, he's ready to overcome it. And that's another thing I've got in 2,500 jokes to start him laughing. There are inevitable situations where something will go wrong, where you don't get a laugh, or uh, where a phone rings while you're speaking, or the lights go out. There are ad-libs for all of these situations <laughs> that will put you on top of the situation. Ad-libs are very, very well rehearsed sometimes. Uh, yes, with big quotes around it. <laughs> I, I found in 34 years in the business that um, a lot of people get a reputation for being a great ad-libber. But from my observation, they are all people with encyclopedic joke memories. And so when a situation occurs, and it usually is a repetitive situation, they're ready. They've got it right there on the tip of their tongue. Mm -hmm. Are there any other little tips that people should know? Obviously, if, if a joke goes under and you, and you show a little slight nervousness, sometimes that'll be detrimental, won't it? Uh, absolutely. If something goes wrong, uh, whether it's a joke not working or... or any sort of a stage weight, you've got to respond to that. Uh, for instance, inevitably, you'll come up to a speaker's stand, and you've got to wrestle the mic up to your level or down to your level. So if you're wrestling it up to your level, if you just throw uh, out a line like, who you're expecting, Mickey Rooney, uh, <laughs> that will cover the little bit of action mm -hmm. necessary to get it up to your level, and it will also show that you're not thrown by it. That's amazing. And, of course, you watch for all of these kind of things when you write for different people, I would think. Very much so. Uh, when I work for a political figure, any time I see a situation happen more than twice, uh, and uh, inevitably you will be asked questions that will, uh, that will be repetitive questions, then you always start to frame an answer. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, um, um, one of my earliest political humor writing was for Barry Goldwater in the 1964 uh, presidential campaign. In fact, I just saw Barry last night in an event. Looks great. Uh, but, but Barry, at that point, was uh, wearing horn-rimmed glasses without any lenses uh, when he did television so that he wouldn't catch the glare of the lights. Mm -hmm. And people used to kid him about it. So finally, we worked out a line. He would take off the uh, glasses, and it stick his finger through the uh, uh, lens, and uh, that would get a little laugh. And then he said, you know, it's just like the Democrat programs. It looks good, but they just don't work. <laughs> and he's covered. And, of course, it was highly quoted at the time. Got it, mate. Bob Orban, I've enjoyed this. It's been a lot of fun. Well, I enjoyed it tremendously, Ken. Anytime you want to do it again, give a holler. All right, terrific. The name of the book is 2,500 Jokes to Start Him Laughing. It's put out by Doubleday and Company, written by Bob Orban, and... Uh, well, you can just have a ton of laughs just looking through the thing, or if you are called upon, of course, from time to time to get up and say a few words, that's what you need. Bob, thank you. Very thanks, Ken.